Today's sermon is entitled, I Am the Vine. The passage I've chosen is John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. It is an amazing day, and I hope and pray that your day is going absolutely fantastic. I know mine is. And I just pray, Lord, that we just, every word that is said, Lord, and every single thought that is given to us, Lord, I pray it's all for you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that the message that is so very important, that you are the vine, comes through to each and every individual. Amen. To start off with, first and foremost, I want to go into the passage of Scripture in question. We're going to start going through Jesus' words. And he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it might be given even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I think this is a really good passage for us to know and to understand. What Jesus is saying is basically that I am the vine. In other words, I am the source of all your life. Sometimes it gets really difficult to remember that, doesn't it? We get inside of the church and we we do different things in the church, use our spiritual gifts to build each other up in the faith, but sometimes we get a little bit distracted. And sometimes we think that, you know what, it's all coming from me. It's coming from my effort and it's my success, but it's not our success at all. It's all the Lord's success because we have to be in the vine in order to do anything inside of God's kingdom. And Christ is trying to tell us how important it is to have a relationship with him. He starts off and he says, I am the true vine. Obviously, as soon as we hear that, we wonder, what are you talking, Jesus, about true vine? Why are you saying it in that way? Couldn't you just said, I am the vine? Why are you saying, I am the true vine? And this gives us an indication of what's going on in Scripture. Jesus is talking to a lot of different individuals, and some of them were Jewish people. And the Jewish people specifically were told that Israel was God's choice vine, Jeremiah 2.21. In other words, they were the one who were to be the lights unto the nations. They were the ones who were called. Show the people of this world what it means to live right and holy, to be distinct, to be set aside for God himself, to serve God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Show the world how much God really means to you by being holy in the sight of the world. And they were supposed to, through their actions, their words, and their deeds, they were supposed to be that light that pointed to God the Father in heaven. But the reality is, is that they didn't do so good at that. Isaiah said, you know what, yes, you were the choice vine, that's for sure, but you have become bad, Isaiah says. Jeremiah, in the very same verse that he says, you were the choice vine, goes on and says, oh, by the way, you become corrupt. And Hosea said, you're empty. You bear no fruit. In other words, you're not doing the things that you're supposed to do. And therefore, Jesus says, oh, by the way, I am the true vine. Jesus says, I am the one who's going to replace Israel as the vine. In other words, Jesus said, God in his original plan ultimately had Israel as the ones who are going to share the light of the nations everywhere and show that God exists. They were supposed to point everyone to God in the way that they lived their lives and in their testimony. It didn't work out very well. And you know what? Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am going to be the one from now on who is going to show the world what it means to live a good and holy life. We are still asked by God, ultimately, and by Jesus, to be a light unto all the nations, but ultimately, our focus is the same as it was Israel's. We are supposed to point people to God the Father in heaven. Everything that we do should point in that direction. Jesus says, I am the true vine. If you really want to succeed inside of God's kingdom, then you're going to have to be attached to me. You're going to have to get your life from me. You're going to have to get your ministry goals from me, and you're going to have to serve in my name. Jesus said, I know that's a really big calling because Israel tried to do it and they failed. They were not successful in doing so. So why would we be any more successful? And Jesus says, because I'm going to give you a brand new heart. Ezekiel talked about it. He said, I will give you a new heart, one that a spirit of God will be inside of you. Instead of that that heart of stone that you used to have, in which you knew the commands of God but couldn't obey them, now you have a heart, the Holy Spirit, which will enable you not only to understand the commands, but actually to be faithful and obedient. And as a result of that, Jesus says, those who are in the vine and those who obey me 
will bear much fruit. Can you imagine that? What a beautiful promise. We have spiritual gifts. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, with those spiritual gifts that have been given to you by the Holy Spirit, he's going to enable you to do great things in my name. You're going to do miracles far greater than I ever did, Jesus said at the end of the Gospel of John. And I believe that's very true. But we have to stay inside of the vine for us to accomplish that. Now, the passage goes on and talks about pruning. Now, if you know anything about plant life, you're supposed to cut off the dead pieces of the plant. The pieces that have already died, you've got to get rid of them because the plant will try to keep putting more energy into that dead piece of the plant in order to keep it alive or or resurrected or keep it going. And it'll expend an awful lot of energy instead of putting it towards the healthy ones. So Jesus says the father is the pruner. The father is the one who's going to basically look at the church as a whole, and he's going to remove those individuals that don't believe in Jesus. They're not part of the vine. Inside of our churches, I believe we have a mix of different kind of people. Hopefully, we have mostly Christians, those who are born-again believers. But we also have a group of individuals that are not believers. And maybe they're just there for various different reasons, such as, you know, my spouse is going, or one of my friends goes, or I just want a little bit of a reputation of being a holy person, but I'm really not connected to the vine. Or maybe they're planted there by Satan himself to cause disruption. But we know in the book of Revelation that, yes, there are some people inside the church who are not born again. And there'll be many people, it says in scriptures, that are going to get there to heaven and say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not speak great things in your name? Did I not do miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to say, go away. I never knew you. I never really had a relationship with you because you did not make me the Lord of your life. You did not belong to the vine. And at the end times, we're going to find out that Jesus is actually going to gather together everyone and separate the wheat from the tares. You know, I often get the question, you know, if you've got a bad apple inside the church, should you remove them? Well, according to Scripture, not necessarily. You know, we all have people inside of the church that some are there for really good reasons, i.e. work inside the vine, and some aren't there for good reasons at all. And there's always some tares inside the church, those difficult people that you can think of that may or may not be Christians. And the question that the disciples asked Jesus, should we really remove all those tares, all those people that don't know you, Jesus, and get them out of the church? And the answer was, no, leave them there. Leave them there unto the end times. I, in the end times, will gather together the wheat, and I will take the tares and cast them into hell. But that will be at the end times. Don't take them out now because they'll take other people with them. And I think that's a really good um, um, lesson for each and every one of us to understand. But it isn't just the people who are not born again that will be dealt with by God the Father. And thankfully, I believe it will be all of us. And I think we all need to be dealt with to a certain degree. You see, when we get born again, we don't have all the spiritual maturity that we could possibly have. We start out, according to Apostle Paul, and Peter said the same thing, as babies in Christ. In other words, we know and we understand some things about God because we have a spirit living inside of us, but there's still pieces of our lives that we haven't fully given over to Jesus. There are areas, for instance, where we might have pride or lust or covetousness or worry or jealousy or idolatry. We haven't given Jesus complete lordship of our entire life. Yes, in order to get born again, you have to make him the Lord of your life, but there are components and pieces of everyone's life that we're still working on giving those sins over to Jesus, confessing them, and saying, Lord, take that from me and allow me to have something else called righteousness. Let me be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there is the challenge. So the Father is going to basically look at us and say, you know what? There's things in your life, branches or pieces of your life that are not for Jesus, and they need to be cut out. They need to be cast into the fire, and they need to be burned. And you know what? He does that all the time. And thank goodness God the Father doesn't leave us the way we are, but instead chooses ultimately to take and refine find us on a daily basis. And I I think that's beautiful, wonderful, but it's not easy though. And that's what I want to say here. It's encouraging knowing that we can repent and all of our sins are forgiven. That is really encouraging. And it's encouraging to know that God has the power to change, mold, and shape us. But in the process of doing so, it can be rather painful. Now, I think that God often gives us lots and lots of time to repent. 
And I think that when we sin, he doesn't always punish us. Sometimes he just waits in grace and waits for us to repent and come back to him. But there are times when we refuse to do so. And I think when we do, that's when the gardener, God the Father in heaven, actually prunes us. In other words, he molds us and he shapes us and through discipline. And that's a difficult process. It's not easy to go through, but it is necessary so that we might produce a great crop of fruit. Let's go back to what Jesus has to say here. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. I like that. I like thinking about that. In other words, Jesus is saying, I've given you a whole bunch of spiritual gifts. I have enabled you through the power of the Holy Spirit to do great things inside of my kingdom. And if you remain in me, you will do great things in my name in the kingdom of God. That's a beautiful promise. And I hope every Christian stands upon that promise and says, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. But we got to continue on what he has to say here. He says, apart from me, though, you can't do anything. In other words, it's also a warning. So you get the blessing first, and then you get the warning. If you don't want to remain in the vine, and if you don't want to be part of Jesus Christ's church, in which he's the cornerstone, then apart from me, you can't do anything anyway. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be granted unto you. And I want to look at the warning here. You know what? Apart from Jesus Christ, we can't do anything. Too many people inside of the church have a problem. And the problem is, is that they don't know their spiritual gifts, or if they do know them, they're not, follow, they're not using their gifts rightly. And you know, when we don't use the gifts that God's given us, then we can't be successful inside of his kingdom. We all have spiritual gifts, and we all have the ability to do things, a divine plan that God gives each and every one of us, based on those spiritual gifts. And if we are willing, then yes, we can do great things in Jesus' name. But if we decide that we're not going to use the spiritual gifts that we have in the way that Jesus Christ tells us to use them even, and we go on our own and we say, I got my own vision, I got my own goals, I got my own dream, thank you very much, I'm going to use my gifts the way I want, then we're no longer in the vine. We're not functioning in the vine the way we should. Jesus alone is the cornerstone of the church, and he alone has the right to tell us how we are to function in that vine. When we decide that we don't want to do that anymore as Christians, then what happens is we stop bearing fruit. Why? Because we're not doing what Jesus Christ wants us to do. And he says, apart from me, there's nothing you can possibly do. You simply can't do it. So here's what Jesus says. If you want to know how to get closer to me and to stay in the vine and stay in my good graces, know my commands. Understand what my commands are. Know exactly not only the commands, but also know how to live the word of God so that you might become closer to me and more like me. When we decide that we don't want to do that, what happens is our efforts, our activities end up being fruitless. In other words, Jesus says, you might as well throw those activities in the fire because in the end, you're not going to succeed until you first submit to my authority. That's what Jesus is trying to say. If you remain in the vine, you can do anything. And I think this is the reason why so many Christians get frustrated. They try to get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ the best way they can, but the problem is is that they have one foot in Satan's kingdom and one foot in God's. We certainly can't do that, and we can't expect to do great things in Jesus' name when we're not even trying to work in Jesus' name. If we don't know what his vision is for our lives, then how are we going to be successful? And the answer is, we're certainly not going to be. If we want to have the fruit of the Spirit, for instance, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and self-control in our lives— then we must submit to the authority of Christ. We must sit back and say, you know what? I want to be different from this world. What was true for the Israelite people, they were going to be blessed. They were going to be this wonderful and beautiful nation that would be lights unto all the other nations and show them God the Father in the way they live is also true for us. We have to be distinct, set aside which means that we don't follow the ways of this world. We don't look for our wisdom from this world, but we look for our wisdom from God's holy word. And we follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are part of the vine. The answer to the questions ultimately that we have in life is that we got to live in accordance with God's word if we want to be more like him. If we want to sin and we want to do that whole bunch of that, then we're not going to get closer to Christ at all. The promise that Jesus gives here 
if you ask anything in my name, you'll automatically get it, is only true if we know Jesus well. And if we're in the vine and we're functioning in the vine well, we will know his will because we will be close to him. He will tell us what he wants us to do. And as long as we're doing what Jesus wants, then we are in the vine and we will be very successful and we'll bear an awful lot of fruit. So if you're not bearing fruit inside of God's kingdom, then you've got to ask the question, is that because I'm trying to do things my own way? Is that because I'm out in the world too much and I'm sinning too much? Is that because what? And and have I ever really given my life fully to Christ? And am I really looking for what he wants me to do in my life? These are some of the questions that you have to ask. Jesus goes on and says, this is to my father's glory. He wants us to bear much fruit. I want to stop there because that's really important. The Father wants us to bear much fruit. He doesn't want us just to sit in the pews and collect dust. I mean, a lot of people come to church and they don't do anything in the church. They don't want to take it that another step. They don't want to serve with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And they don't want to use their spiritual gifts. And here's what what Jesus says. My Father, for his glory, I want you to serve. I want you to use your gifts. I want you to do great things in my Father's name. And you're going to bear a lot of fruit. Why? Because the Father wants you to. Wow. And that will show the whole world that you are my disciples when they see all the miraculous things that you're going to do in the Father's name. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete and that your joy also might be complete. Jesus is basically telling us that we need to go back to his word. He's telling us if we really want to be lights unto the nations and function well within his vine, then we have to know and understand the words of wisdom that he has given to us. We need to obey him, and that will be a great source of joy in our life. In verse 10, Jesus explains what he meant when he said that fruit was contingent on his words abiding inside of the Christian. Just like Jesus, who remained in the Father's love by obeying him, we've got to obey Jesus Christ too as well. His word, his beautiful and wonderful word, is not a burden at all. We sometimes look at God's word and we say, oh my goodness, that's a lot of commands. And it certainly is. If you go to the Old Testament, there's a lot of commands there. And they seem overwhelming. I know they certainly do to me. As you read more and more of them, you go, who could ever follow all those commands? And then you go to the New Testament and Jesus says, oh, by the way, I just don't want you to follow those commands. I want you to know and understand the reason I gave those commands. Understand not the letter of the law, but understand the spirit of the law. Understand why I gave you them and follow the spirit of all the laws I gave you. Talk about a daunting task. And sometimes we look at God's commands and say, that's a huge burden. Who could ever follow all of them? That seems almost unreasonable. But yet we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're more than able to follow all those commands. And those commands are not a burden, according to 1 John 5, 3. It's a sense of incredible joy. Out of love for the sacrificial lamb of God, we must genuinely want to obey Jesus, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we have God's Spirit living inside of us who's going to reveal to us the truth of his commands, what they mean, and how to apply them to our lives. So we have everything we need to be holy in God's sight. Like Peter, we're going to sin. Yes, absolutely. Like all the apostles, they all sin, and we sin all the time. But there's a mechanism for sin, and that's called forgiveness. Repent. Tell Jesus Christ, I am sorry. Please forgive me for my sins. And it says in 1 John 1, 9, I will cleanse you, Jesus says, from all unrighteousness. We've got to sit back and say, I want to be empowered by you, Lord Jesus Christ, in the vine to obey you. I think Christians, and and I try to do this myself, but it's hard to do. I think we need to be humble. I think we need to sit back and say, you know what, Lord, I can't do anything without you. Nothing. I cannot succeed in your kingdom if I don't have your blessing. And if I don't know what you want me to do in in my life, then I'm certainly going to fail. And if I don't, if I'm not willing to obey you, Lord, I can't be successful in the first place. So the first key is submission, willingness to obey all your commands. And then I can feel unspeakable joy. Think about what the, the word of God offers us, a kind of joy that's different than this world. You see, this world would say, joy is getting a new piece of equipment. I like playing guitar. 
So I have all this different equipment. And every once in a while, I'll buy a piece of equipment. And does that give you a little bit of happiness, so to speak? It, yeah, it does. And it's a lot of fun playing with a new toy. Absolutely. Praise be to God. But you know what? It's not joy. It's not unspeakable joy. It's not the kind of joy that Jesus is talking about here. He's saying that through our obedience, we inherit the same kind of joy that was given to Jesus Christ by God the Father. We get unspeakable joy, the kind of joy that gets you up in the morning and you say, I'm so glad to be alive. The kind of joy that says, I can walk through the valleys of the shadow of death and fear no evil for thou art with me. The kind of joy that says, I can go through anything in your name, Jesus Christ, as long as you hold on to me, I've got everything I need because you are my portion forever. That's the kind of joy that we get. And it is beautiful and remarkable. Staying in the vine is so important for us as Christians. The kind of joy that knows one heart is glad and one tongue is always going to confess him as Lord. I love what the psalmist says. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure. Why? Because thou art with me. Thou art my rod and my staff and I will rejoice. I got thinking about the prodigal son. Remember after a while, after he sinned a whole bunch, took off and just never stopped sinning, it seems. Eventually, he actually confesses and says, you know what, I've done wrong. Comes back to the father and says, I've done wrong in your sight. There's no question. And in God's sight, too. And he said, I'm only worthy to be your servant. But please let me be your servant because right now I'm eating pig feet. And I just want to be a servant just that much. Just let me have that much. And the father wraps his arms around him and, 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 and weeps and cries and says, you are loved. You were always loved, regardless of the fact that you sinned, regardless of the fact that you wandered away. You are loved in ways you can't even imagine. And, and, and the shepherd, he comes and gets us when we don't know what we're doing. He comes and gets us when we are sinning against him. He comes and gets us when we are lost. He comes and uplifts us and holds on to us. And you know what? Who wouldn't give every possession in the world to have Jesus Christ hug them? And this is the kind of joy Jesus is saying. If you stay in the vine, then I will give you that kind of joy, the unspeakable joy that wells up in your soul, regardless of your circumstances, even if they're really bad, I will give you that kind of joy because you are my children. Jesus goes on and he says this, my commandment is this, love each other as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus is making a very strong proclamation here. He's saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love one another. If we are born again believers, and we are part of the vine, and if we've given our heart to Jesus Christ, then we're commanded to love him and to love the people that are around us too as well. If we want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, we need to make room for one another. Think about the church you're in right now. Sometimes it is difficult, isn't it, to get wrong, along with everybody. Sometimes there are people within the church that are so unique and so different from you that it becomes very difficult to associate with them. There are people that had differences of opinion, especially when it comes to scripture, or differences of opinion in other areas of life, and they are difficult to associate with, difficult to make room for them. We are called to be one body of Christ, and Christ is the cornerstone of the church, and we are called to love each other with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We are called to bear each other's burdens, and we're called to lift one another up. So we want to do this. This sense of love for each other must come from the Lord. And we got to sit back when we start thinking about some of the people in the church that might be a little bit difficult to get along with, especially considering the fact that, you know what, they might have wronged you, or maybe they didn't wrong you. They just are different than you. we got to sit back and say, but Christ loved us. Even while we were his enemies, it says Christ died for us. He went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins because he loves us that much. And he's given us a demonstration of what real love is. And he wants us to exemplify or to copy that kind of love with our own relationships inside the church, which means that we got to love people. I mean, really love them, unconditionally love them. You know what? I had one fellow who told me, another pastor friend of mine, he says, the love that God has for you is never going to change. It's the same as it was when you were born to the time that you got born again to the time that you are right now. It's the same whether you sin or don't sin. He loves you always the same. He might be disappointed in the choices you're making. Absolutely. 
but he still loves you. And I got thinking about that. Too bad we couldn't love each other in the same way. Too bad we couldn't make room for other people within our lives. You know what? The human anatomy or our minds or our sinful nature says we should fight those people that are different than us. But that's not what Jesus says. I want you to get along with one another. I want you to follow the commands because they're no longer a burden to you. And I want you to build each other up in the faith. Those who have been purchased at a price should want to honor Christ in everything that they ultimately do. He has paid the price for their sins so that they might obey him. So we got to sit back and say as Christians, yes, Lord. I want to obey you. But one of the greatest commandments of all, Jesus says, two of them, is love the Lord and love each other. Are we doing that as a church? Are we truly loving Jesus and loving others in the church? Or we got some divisions that are going on? We want to make sure we don't have any divisions, but we love each other the same. And that's a hard thing to do, but it can be done in the name of Jesus. Jesus goes on and says in the last part of this section of the scripture, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might bear much fruit, fruit that will last, and so that you might ask anything in my name and the father will give you. This is my command, love one another. I think this is a passage that is absolutely remarkable and beautiful. It's talking about unity. It's talking about us striving to look at the commands of Jesus Christ and to obey them with all of our hearts. It's telling us that we should pick up our Bibles, not with the intent just to read and amass a whole bunch of information like the Pharisees did, but instead to pick up our Bibles to read and to obey it. To invite Jesus Christ into our hearts and say, Lord, I want you to change me. It's almost like we should be picking up God's holy word. And every time that we read a verse, we say to God, the Father in heaven, prune me, change me, mold me, make me different. I know it's going to be painful for you to get rid of that sin in my life, but I still want it gone so I might be more like you. This is what it means to be in the vine. Christ demonstrated his love for his friends. He died for them on the cross. We are to love each other with an undying love. We are to love each other the way Christ did. And we are to build each other up in the the faith and help one another. Now, this journey in the vine is not easy, is it? It's a difficult journey because, of course, the I in me is always going to try to assert itself. We're always going to try to sit back and say, but I want this, or I want to do this, or I want to be in charge. There's always going to be that I component that's going to say, I have the freedom to do anything I want, Paul says, but I shouldn't do everything because not all things are beneficial. Because we have free will, we often like to do the things that we look at and we say, that's going to bring me a little bit of happiness. I'm going to chase after the things of the world because there's many things that will make me temporarily happy, but they will not give you the source of joy that Jesus is trying to talk about. Unity inside the church is knowing and understanding that we all have spiritual gifts. It's knowing and understanding that whatever those gifts that we have are meant to fulfill a divine role. And our goal, being Christians inside of the vine, is to find out from Jesus Christ, the source of our life, what is my role? What are my gifts? What do you want me to do, Jesus? And as soon as you tell me, that is what I'm going to do, and only that. I'm not going to step into other people's areas because I don't want to. I want to do whatever you command me to do. This is why Jesus says following his commands are so very important. It's precisely then when we for, we remember that we're nothing without Christ, that we start getting aligned closer to what he sees as his church. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So we want to be the branches, but we cannot be the branches without Jesus, who is the vine who gives us life. So it's my challenge to each and every one of us to love and to support each other, to find ways to support the ministry that people are assigned to, to not to overstep one's boundaries and to go to other places of ministry of which one does not belong to and was never called for in the first place. We have enough ministry with whatever Christ gave to us, and therefore we should sit back and say, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you've given me is enough, and I'm going to go out there and serve you in the way that I want. And I got thinking, this passage on the vine is absolutely incredible. It's one of the last I am sayings that Jesus gives. 
He's saying, I am God, of course, when he says, I am. But he's also inviting us to understand that if we want to be successful in his kingdom, then yes, we've got to understand that we can't do anything without Jesus. He is the vine, we are the branch. Without him, we can do nothing. But with him, we can do anything, anything that he asks, that is. And that is the promise. What a beautiful promise to give to the church today. A church that ultimately is struggling. And we look at our churches, they are struggling. They're trying to figure out how to get more people in the pews, which is not an easy task. They're trying to get out there and evangelize and tell people about the Lord Jesus. And that's not easy either because there's so many differing opinions out there. It's a struggle that people are going through all the time. And the churches are trying to find a way to be relevant, but at the same time, not to change God's word. And that's not easy. This world is becoming more and more like Satan and less and less like Christ. And our light, though, I think shines brighter in that circumstance. While we could give up in absolute defeat and say this world's never going to believe in Jesus because he's saying there's only one way to God the Father in heaven, not multiple paths, and that's what the world likes. You know what? The reality is, is that we got to sit back and say, this is a time to rejoice because in the darkness, light shines the most. And yes, this world is dark, but my goodness, showing them Jesus Christ makes all the difference. And the truth is, the more we live God's commands today, the more separate and distinct that we are going to be. The more the world's going to realize that we believe in Jesus, and Jesus offers the way, truth, and life, and wisdom that goes way beyond human wisdom. And there is the wonder of it all, isn't there? Because as they see us living for Jesus and doing miracles in his name, they wonder, what do you have that I don't have? Especially considering the fact that Christians go through trials and tribulations, many of them with a smile on their face. They have the sense of calm and peace and joy that is just doesn't, it defies their circumstances. Why? Because they love the Lord. Because they know Jesus is their portion. And no matter what happens to them, even the worst thing, and we often think that's physical death, is actually going to be something that's going to turn into a blessing because the angels are going to come get you and carry you to heaven. And you're going to be with the Lord forever. So we sit back and say, he's my portion. And whatever happens to me, as long as it's in his will, I'm okay with that. I might struggle with it. I might not like trials and tribulations. I might feel some pain and some anguish, absolutely. But I'll take my anxiety and I'll cast them upon the Lord. I will trade my yoke of discomfort, my sadness and my depression and my anger and my situation. I'll, I'll, I'll give that to the Lord and I'll take his yoke because it says his yoke's really easy. And while I'm serving him in the vine... I will do so with gladness in my heart and thanksgiving, and I will build the people around me up in the faith, and I will celebrate the differences they ultimately have. And I'll sit back and say, I love them because you first loved me, Jesus. And I will try to love them in the same way. Is this the way you live your life? Are you part of the vine? Are you got parts of your life that you need to get rid of that you know are not good, and you know they're not bearing any fruit because they don't come from Jesus? Then ask the Father to prune you. Yes, it will be difficult. I understand that. And it certainly is. But ask them anyway. So that those areas of your life might be given away, might be gotten rid of, that you might confess those sins and be forgiven, cleansed from all unrighteousness. And then ask the Lord, now show me, show me how to live my life the right way. If only the church would do this. Can you imagine we would be lights unto the nation. Jesus would still be the true vine, absolutely. But at least the church would function in the way that it's supposed to. And that is to point everyone to God the Father in heaven for his honor and for his glory. Can you imagine the peace in our churches if we could just function in the vine the way the Lord wants us to? So I pray that for your church and for my church too as well. I just pray that we would learn how to function in love with one another in the vine and always put the Lord first. Amen.